today. Amen. All of us can lift up our hands and say, thank you, Lord, for doing what you did in my life, doing what you did at Calvary. And not only what you've done in my life, but what you continue to do in my life. Paul said, I, I, I'm, I know, I have confidence, I trust. I, there's no doubt in my heart that what uh, he has done and what he, is, uh, what he has, he'll continue to keep. Until that day that he comes again. He has you. He has me. And he'll keep us. Jesus said this. Not one person that the Father has put in my hand has anybody been able to pluck out of it. I'm glad the day that he took a hold of me. The day that he touched my heart and, and made me a new creature. Uh, he's never let me go. The old song the kids sing a lot of times. Uh, we, we hear him sing so many times. Uh, the song, He Holds the Whole World in His Hands. I'm glad He does. He holds you and me, brothers and sisters, in His hands. And what a confidence and what a trust we have this morning. We want to welcome everybody today to the house of the Lord. Just uh, settle in. Let's worship God this morning. If you're visiting with us, we're honored that you're here. 
Uh, we just like worshiping God. If you want to raise your hand, raise it. If you want to say amen, say it. Uh, I believe if the Holy Spirit leads it, it'll be in order this morning. So uh, let's just worship him. Would you stand with me? We're going to take up our offering this morning. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day that you've given us to come to your house. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for, uh, uh, God, the songs that's been sung this morning and the reminder that you're a great Savior. Uh, Lord, that you're a wonderful Savior, and uh, Lord, you're a great God, and Father, we're so thankful for that. Thankful, Lord, that uh, many times through our life we look back and you've reminded us of that great truth. Heavenly Father, I ask you this morning just to continue to uh, let your spirit flow through this place. God, as we take up our offering, Lord, I pray, Lord, that you bless it. Let us be good stewards of that that you've given us. And God, I pray, Lord, that you just speak to hearts this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Continue to stand, help the choir to sing. fellowship this morning. saved by grace there is a resting place and in just a few more days it will be mine some call it heaven I call it home some
Thank you, Sister Debbie. I'm glad I could call it home as well this morning. I love the, the, the little saying at the last part of that last verse. It said, just one look and you'll know the best is yet to come. And I'm glad that's so true this morning. As Eric mentioned, Brother Luke has gone this morning preaching up in Hall's community for that special service. And as he was playing on that, we were playing on this service this morning. And I, I'm just one to be truthful, especially with a friend. And I, and I consider Luke a friend of mine. And I said, Luke, I said, uh, I'll be praying for you as you go up to Clear Springs Sunday morning. I said, but I'm also thankful you're gone. And he kind of looked at me strange. And I said, because finally our Sunday morning crowd will get some good preaching. I hope we're still friends after that comment. <laughs> Amen. You pray for him this morning. You pray for him and Shauna as soon as the service is over. They're taking off to Wake Forest to talk to a surgeon and uh, about getting some things taken care of for him. So uh, you just pray for him this morning. I invite you to turn to 2 Samuel chapter number 11. 2 Samuel chapter number 11 message I have on my heart this morning is one that's been preached for many years by many preachers. It's one that in our day and time today isn't that popular. Many people have forgotten about it and uh, I, I hate to say it but I feel like probably many pulpits have forgotten about it but I still believe that if it's in the word of God it's necessary for our lives. Uh, we can find application for our life, and that's what we want to do this morning. Second Samuel chapter 11, just going to read one verse. Would you stand with me this morning? Second Samuel 11, verse number 1. The Bible said, and it came to pass, after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabah, but David tarried still at Jerusalem. This story this morning is one that we all heard of. It's where David commits his great sin with Bathsheba. But I want to say to us this morning that David's problem did not begin when he saw her in the bathtub. David's problem did not begin when he walked out on the rooftop and saw her on the other rooftop bathing. His problem began in verse number one when the Bible says he stayed behind in Jerusalem. I want to preach to us on the subject this morning, staying behind. Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer this morning. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you, Lord, for, uh, God, this service we've been in and uh, God, it just seems like your spirit has been so sweet in this place. Heavenly Father, I pray, God, as we get into your word this morning, that you speak to our hearts. God, that you uh, let us evaluate our own lives. Uh, and God, see where we stand with you. God, speak to somebody this morning. Change a heart. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. The Bible said that when it came time for kings to go to war, that David tarried behind, that he stayed behind in Jerusalem. David was the main king. If anybody should have been on the front lines of the battle that day, it should have been King David. But rather he tarried behind in Jerusalem. This verse introduces us to one of the most notorious acts of treachery in the Old Testament. It introduces us to King David's adultery with Uriah's wife Bathsheba, followed by his shameful murder of his friend Uriah. Uriah was not just one of David's uh, men. He wasn't just one of David's soldiers. David was on the inside, or Uriah was one of uh, on the inside circle of David. If you'd have it, he was David's uh, part of David's secret service. Not only was he a close uh, person with David, but the Bible leads us to believe they were pretty good friends. Yet David commits 
this horrible act of adultery with Uriah's wife and then followed by to try to cover uh, the act up and try to cover up that she is now pregnant. He kills and has Uriah killed. The Bible said uh, here in verse number one that uh, it was time for the kings to go to battle. It was springtime according to their calendar and it was time for the kings to ride off on their horses to the battlefields uh, and begin to take charge of what was going on. In this verse, David uh, was supposed to be doing that with his men, but for whatever reason, he stayed behind in Jerusalem. May I declare to you and I this morning that when we spiritually stay behind, that is when sin takes form in our life and we get in trouble. When we spiritually stay behind what we know is right, uh, when we spiritually stay behind what we know we should be doing, that's when we begin to get in trouble. We live in a society today that it's everybody else's fault we get in trouble. We live in a society today that uh, it's everybody else's uh, problem. Uh, it's a society, we, we're good at playing a game, we're good at playing the blame game. It's his fault, it's her fault. Uh, and even some this morning have gone as far as saying, well, it's God's fault, I'm the way that I am. Let me read to you James chapter one, verse 13 through 15. The Bible said, let no man say when he is tempted that I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away with his own lust and enticed. And when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Let me read to you verse 14 again. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away with his own lust. It's not somebody else's fault. It's not mama's fault or daddy's fault we are the way we are, but according to the word of God, it's our own fault that we fall short and we sin. We live in a nation full of victims uh, one preacher put it that we live out the practice and we practice victimology. Uh, it's, a, it's a practice that's gone all the way back to the Garden of Eden. For when Adam and Eve fell, the Bible tells us that uh, God came to Adam. And what did Adam say? He didn't say, Lord, I'm sorry. He didn't say, Lord, I did wrong. I know I did wrong. It's my fault. I shouldn't have done what I did. But rather he points to Eve and he says, it's her fault. And then when God comes to Eve and begins to talk to her, Eve didn't say, Lord, uh, I'm sorry, I did do wrong. I listened to the serpent. I, I disobeyed your commandment. Uh, and then I uh, talked my husband into doing it. But rather, she says, God, it's the serpent's fault that I did what it did. The problem is the serpent didn't have a leg to stand on. If you'd have it, sin, when it's confronted to us, comes from the devil himself. It's not everybody else's fault. It's not everybody else's fault that uh, we do wrong and we end up in trouble. It wasn't Uriah's fault that David uh, did what he did. It wasn't uh, 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 his servant's fault. Uh, it wasn't King David's uh, uh, people. It wasn't the nation he was leading uh, that drove him to do such a horrible act. But it was David's fault that he did what he did. Some people say, well, I, I think it's God's fault. God made me how I am and it's his fault I do the things I do. James 1.13 says, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. Hear me out this morning. If you hear nothing else, I say jot this down. Take note of this. Sin is an inside job. Sin uh, comes from within uh, our lives when the devil entices us with it. There was a man who said he would turn his life around. There was a gentleman that said, I, I'm going to turn, I have turned my life around. He said, I used to be depressed and miserable, now I'm miserable and depressed. Listen, sin is a choice. You can either obey God's will for your life or you can simply stay behind and sin. 
I want to look at three things this morning that happens when we spiritually stay behind. Number one, we find a courtship that leads to consent. Look in verse two in the first part of verse three. The Bible said, and it came to pass at evening tide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house and from the roof he saw a woman washing herself. And the woman was very beautiful to look upon and David sent messengers and took her. Now think with me just for a moment. This is Uriah's wife, Bathsheba. Uriah and David had been around each other for years. They were close friends. They were close confidants. Uh, They uh, had a lot in common. Don't you think that David had saw Bathsheba before? If they were that close and they had that much dealings with one another, don't you think David had seen Bathsheba before? I I don't think that. Uh, The fact that she was beautiful, uh, that she was a beautiful woman, uh, enticing because he had seen her before. Once again, his problem was he wasn't doing what he was supposed to be doing. He was in the wrong place. Uh, He was with the wrong people. And David stayed behind in Jerusalem. That's how the devil works in our life. He puts something in front of us that tries to lead us away. He will try to courtship us until we consent to move forward with that sin. Listen today, uh, God, the devil himself doesn't even make you sin. The devil cannot make you sin. He'll entice you, he'll try to get you to do it, but it's you and I that, my friend, consent to take part of that sin. Once again, James 1.14 says, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away with his own lust. That word drawn away means to entice. It means to entrap. The devil will throw the bait out and you and I will choose to take it. In an episode of Andy Griffith, Barney catches Otis stealing some chickens. He throws him in jail and several days later, a uh, uh, sheriff walks in and, and he says, Otis, why was you stealing those chickens? And Otis said, the devil made me do it. And he looked at him and said, well, it's quite funny, ever since you've been in jail, the devil's not made one nay person steal a chicken. You know what I believe the lesson from that is, is the devil will entice, he'll put it in front of us, but he cannot make us do those things. Adrian Rogers said this. He said, the devil will throw a match, but he has to have the gasoline of an unholy life to start a fire. Listen, my dear friend, this morning, the devil will entice. He will try to draw us away, but it's you and I that will consent to those sins. David did not have to get with Bathsheba. He did not have to sin for her and and to lie with her. And uh, he didn't have to uh, send Uriah out on the front porch of the battlefield to have him martyred and killed. Uh, But my friend, it was David's choice that he did that. Listen to me this morning, you that are here under this place. Listen to me this morning, uh, Anderson County. Hear me this morning, Tennessee. Hear me, uh, United States. Hear me, world, when I say, a friend, sin is no one else's fault but our own this morning. It's not, uh, my friend, uh, who used to be before us. It's not the generation past. It's not the generation ahead. It's you and I that stand in the need of prayer. Lord, it's me. It's me, oh, Lord, standing in the need of prayer. We are the ones that consent to that sin. The devil will entice you, he'll entice me, but will the one to consent to that action? This word drawn away in James chapter one where it says that we'll be drawn away by our own lust gives us a picture of fishing almost. How you would take a lure and throw it into the waters and try to entice the fish to bite it. I remember the first time my father took me fishing. We was at Lenore City Park. We walked out on the dock there at Fort Loudon and we began to fish. I really didn't understand the whole concept, but we, we tied this little uh, plastic piece onto some fishing line and threw it out in the water. And uh, I caught a little uh, catfish that day. I also caught my dad the second time I hooked his hand and uh, caught him. But it's a picture of being enticed or drawn away. 
You remember that I said sin is an inside job. Mark, right down in the margins of your Bible, Mark 7 and 21 through 23. Here's the words of Jesus himself. He said, for from within, out of the heart of men perceive evil thoughts, adulteries, fornication, murders, thieves, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. It's an inside job. It's choices you and I make. Uh, I was reading an article, it's been a few years ago, of a mother who was caught and arrested for abusing her children, almost beat them to death. And her excuse behind that was, but she said, because her children were just too wild. It wasn't the fact that her children was wild. She chose to beat them like she beat them. Her kids didn't come to her and say, Mommy, beat us up to, we're an ICU on a ventilator. It was her choice. It ain't your mom or dad's fault that you did what you did last night or last week. It's not your children's fault or it's not how you were born or the genes that you were born with or the DNA that makes you who you are. It's a choice you make. It comes from within. So the devil will entice us and then we consent to that. But secondly, the consent leads to conception. Look in verse number four and five here in 2 Samuel. The Bible said, and David sent messengers and took her. And she came in unto him, and he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned unto her house. And the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am a child. She sent word back to the king, David, I'm pregnant. When that lust that the devil presents to you and I, we consent and we partake it. When that lust is presented and to us, we partake of it, we conceive it, and if you'd have it, we become pregnant with that sin. It becomes who we are. It's in us. It's not outside forces that causes that sin to come in. It's kind of, let me explain it to you like this. It's kind of like a gallon of milk. You go out and buy a gallon of milk, and instead of putting it into the refrigerator, you set it on the countertop. And after a few days, you look what happens to that milk. Or take a slab of meat a big old steak, and instead of putting it in the freezer and the refrigerator, let it sit on the countertop for a few days. It's what's on the inside of it will come out. My friend, this morning now the heart pursues the evil thoughts. Out of our heart proceeds the evil things. Going back to James chapter 1, the Bible said in verse 15, Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. I ask you this morning, what is in your life that's keeping you out of the will of God? What has caused you, like David, to stay behind where you ought not to be? What has happened maybe uh, yesterday or, or two weeks ago or a month ago or three months ago or maybe a year or two years ago that you're just not where you need to be with God? Let me tell you this morning, when you stay behind in the will of God, you'll get yourself in trouble. The devil throws out and he tempts us. It's kind of like the little boy who was saving up to buy a baseball bat. He had prayed and he had saved and saved and saved and his mom was walking past his bedroom one night and heard him praying and she stopped and just leaned her ear into the door and heard what he said and here was the prayer of the little boy who had tried and tried and tried to save this money for this baseball bat. He said, oh Lord, please help me save money for my baseball bat and God, please don't let the ice cream man come down the street. I know what he means. Christina's had me on a strict diet for the past three weeks and 
I'm about angry. I mean, I tell you, I can't eat bread. I can't drink milk. I can't eat cheese. I can't do nothing. And I've prayed. I had to pray hard this week. I walked into the family life center and they had bowls of ice cream sitting out there. And I said, Lord, <laughs> deliver me from evil. For thou art with me. When sin presents itself, it's our choice to partake of it or to walk away from it. In South Africa, there's a strange vine known as the matador. It's a vine that begins to grow at the bottom of a tree and it slowly makes its way up to the top. Right before it reaches the top, it releases a poison on that tree and causes it almost to die immediately. And once the tree dies, the vine will grow the rest of the way up to the top of that tree and it'll blossom a flower to crown itself victor over that tree. My friend, I want you to hear me this morning. The devil would love to sit back and crown himself. He would love to sit back and laugh uh, at us, causing us to stay behind the will of God in our life. He would love to, uh, to take hold of, of our life just like that matador. And by the way, the word matador means uh, killer. It means something that will kill. And Jesus said in the scriptures that the devil has come what? To kill, steal, and destroy. The devil loved to sit back in the bowels of hell and laugh at you and I after he's destroyed our life. The question is, will we choose to let him do that or will we choose to stay in the will of God? David chose to stay behind. Then number three, we see a conception that leads to consummation. You'll find that in the rest of this chapter, verses 6 through 27. You'll find where uh, David, uh, when he finds out that Bathsheba is pregnant and finds out that she is with child that he begins to try to cover up those things that she has done. He goes to uh, his servants and he goes to his men. He says, I tell you what I want you to do. He, first of all, Uriah comes back home from the battlefield and David had some words with him. Uriah went home and David didn't want him to go home. He didn't want him to find out. Finally, David conspired this plan that he had put Uriah on the forefront of the army when they went out to battle so that when the first shots were fired and the first uh, bit of war began to take place, your ride would be right down the front line and hopefully be killed. David's plan went the way, it wanted it, what, the way he wanted it to. David's plan went exactly how he wanted it to and his friend, his helper, his companion in war died. Because David stayed behind. He wasn't where he was supposed to be. And the Bible said in verse 27 of that chapter, if you still have your Bibles open, notice what the last part of verse 27 says. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. James 1.15, And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. That phrase, it is finished, literally means when it is full grown. That, that phrase, it is finished, means when it's fully grown. You know a lot of times at first when sin is conceived, when the devil presents something to us, it's nothing major. It's something just small. It, it, it maybe even might seem innocent. But then it begins to take over our life. We don't notice it until it seemingly is full grown and it brings forth spiritual death in our life. Maybe when he walked out on the roof of his house that day and just glanced over to Uriah's house, there was Bathsheba taking a bath. That's something innocent. Everybody has to do that. But the devil presented David with something and he took it. 
and it brought physical death to Bathsheba's husband and it brought spiritual death to David. It brings forth death. I've heard it said time and time again, first sin will fascinate, then it will assassinate. First sin will thrill, and then sin will kill. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 25, you know it. There's a way, the Bible says, that seems right unto a man. But the end, when it's fully grown, the end thereof is death. Ten young people got saved this week in Bible school. One of them said something to me. I can't remember his name right off. Young boy, probably 11 or 12 years old. He come up to me after he got saved. Actually, it was the next night after he got saved. And he said, Preacher Lee, I feel wonderful. I said, why do you feel wonderful? He said, because Jesus saved me and I don't have to worry about my sin." If you and I would just think about that for a moment. If you and I are saved, we don't have to worry about sin unless we consent to partake of sin because he's delivered us from all manner of evil. He's delivered us from those things. Pastor R.G. Lee put it like this. He said, you can eat on the devil's corn if you want to, but you'll choke on the cob. Think about that. You can eat on the devil's corn if you want to, but you'll choke on the cob. I read a story, it's probably been 15 years ago, about a young man who, uh, his name was Sammy. Sammy was just a young boy, and back then you didn't have to worry about uh, strangers, you didn't have to worry about Uh, pedophiles picking up kids. You let your kids run around all the time. Sammy decided to go fishing one morning. And on his way to the pond, he found a pile of worms and he picked them up and put them in his bucket and went down the fishing hole. After about 30, 45 minutes of fishing, he had caught so many fish He was on his way back home and his arm began to get numb. It began to turn purple. And about the time he got to the county road, one of the sheriff's officers was driving by and little Sammy, just a young man, 12, 13 years old, passed out right there on the road. The sheriff stopped and he picked him up and rushed him to the hospital. When the sheriff went back, to the place to get Sammy's fishing rod and pail and things, he looked down into the bucket where them worms were. And come to find out the worms that Sammy had picked up along the way were not worms, they were baby rattlesnakes. It didn't seem like much. He'd get one out and maybe notice his hand hurt a little bit, but uh, I'm going to keep fishing. But those little things led to a big problem. Dear friends, this morning, listen. The little things may not seem like much. But when you partake of them, the sin will be a big, big problem. Every head bow, every eye closed in this place this morning. I'm going to ask them to come and get a song of invitation today. What's the answer, Lee? What's the answer to the things I'm dealing with in my life? When it comes to the will of God in my life, I've stayed behind like David. When it comes to the things that I've done recently, I'm kind of like David. I've tried to hide them. What's the answer? The answer is exactly what David prayed in his prayer in Psalm 51 whenever these things happened. Psalm 51.10, David said, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. That's the answer. Lord, forgive me. Lord, make me a new person. 
I wonder who's here this morning. You say, Lee, I, I'm one that I've stayed behind spiritually. I've stayed behind in my life. I'm not where I need to be in the will of God in my life. And I want to get to where I need to be. If that's you and you say, Lee, that's me. I, I'm, I'm behind. I stay behind. And I need somebody to lift me to God this morning in prayer. If that's you, would you just slip your hand up? Just be honest this morning. I see you. Thank you, sir. I see you. Thank you. Somebody else, I see you. Thank you. Will there be others this morning say, I'm just not where I need to be. I've got sin in my life. I need to confront it. I need to be honest. I need to take care of this this morning. Raise your hand. Say, preacher, you pray for me. I see you. Thank you. There be others this morning. So many of you. Maybe you're here and you've never been saved. You say, Lee, sin has power over my life. I've never made heaven my home. I want to be saved this morning. And I need you to pray for me. I need you to I want you to pray for me. Would you just slip your hand up and say, Lee, I don't know if I've ever been saved. I don't know I'm going to heaven whenever I die. I need to make it right with God. Heavenly Father, we come before your throne of grace this morning. Thank you, Lord, for all you've done for us. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us this opportunity to be in the house of God. I pray for these whose hands were raised. God, thank you, Lord, for letting them be honest and God, I pray, Lord, as your sweet spirit begins to speak in this place, God, that you just touch their hearts, draw them to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand. Connie's going to lead this in a stanza of song. Search me, oh God. If you feel like the Lord is beckoning you to come, as some has already come, I'm going to ask you to move this morning. There's room at the cross for all of us today. By the Spirit of God is speaking in this place, I invite you to come. Will there be others, be honest this morning and just move to the sweet spirit and the sweet voice of the Lord. Say, I need to fix things between me and God. I need to fix things. I need to do business with the Heavenly Father. We're going to sing one more verse. Let me say this this morning. When he's knocking, when he's speaking, you answer. The Spirit of God will not always strive with man. If he's knocking on your heart this morning, if he's calling your name saying, Where art thou? If he's speaking to you and say, come closer, you've lagged behind a little bit. If he's calling you this morning, you need to come. We're going to sing one more verse this morning. If God's speaking with your heart, I want you to come. moving if you need to come you're more than welcome
you still feel like you need to pray, this is your time. God is speaking to your heart. I invite you to come. got a family here this morning that has been visiting us for several months now. The Braden family, Pastor Luke and I spoke with them a few Sundays ago back in the office and uh, just an exciting family. We left that meeting, we actually told Brother Eric uh, that evening, that after, yeah, that evening after the service was over how excited we were uh, after getting to meet with this lovely family. Uh, we got Brother Jesse, Sister Carolyn, uh, we've got Nathan, and his son, Nathan. And by the way, I just want to say I love his bow tie. <laughs> He's become my friend. <laughs> They're wanting to join our church from First Baptist Church in Clinton by letter. What's the pleasure of the church this morning? Brother Moderator, uh, make a motion we accept you, brother. Motion is second. All those agreeing, let me know I'm saying amen. amen. All opposed, like sign. Eyes have it, so be it. Aren't you glad the Lord's still adding to the church? Still just moving amongst his people. <laughs> Praise God. As we dismiss this morning, I want you to come around and shake hands with the Bradens. Don't forget, Sister Carol needs to meet with all. You want to meet over here, Carol? All the women can meet over here on this side of the church to get ready for homecoming next Sunday. Be back tonight, 6 o'clock. Brother, Brother Bill Edmonds is preaching for us. You come back. We'll see you tonight at 6 o'clock.